Welcome. Uh, I'm Steve Frobeter. I'm the co-chair of the Hopkinton Trails Club. The other co-chair is Peter Legoy, right there. Um, thank you for coming. This is our second annual um, Trails Forum. Um, we hope tonight to be able to update you on things that are happening with trails in Hopkinton. We also have a couple of uh, guest presentations that we think uh, that you'll find welcome. We think you'll find interesting. So we'll get right to it. Um, that obviously is the map of the known trails in Hopkinton. Um, we have a pretty wide open patch to work in. They're all around, most of them are around the outside and the big lake. Just to orient you, this is Route 85 that goes up here. Uh, this is the center trail. Um, the state park is up there. That's what it's white on. So this is our uh, agenda for the night. I have a couple of opening comments. Then uh, Robert Wyneck is um, um, a guest speaker of ours. He's uh, from Holliston, and I think would be fair to say he's the father of the Holliston Upper Charles Trail. And he's going to share some uh, thoughts uh, and remembrances about where Holliston, how Holliston got to where they are with a, can we say completed? So nearly completed. Okay. My friend Reno Deluzio, who is the father of the Upper Charles Trail in Milford, would say the same thing. Even though I would say it's completed, he, would, he still has several things he wants to accomplish there. Um, then Peter Legoy is going to uh, take you through a series of slides on what we have done uh, as, a, uh, as a trails community in uh, 2017 and what we hope to accomplish in 2018. And then uh, Stuart Hanna, uh, an avid um, off-road biker, is uh, going to take us uh, through a little talk about uh, the uh, biking uh, opportunities in uh, Hopkinton State Park and uh, in uh, Vietnam. So um, I, I think it's obvious that uh, we're all here because we have some interest in trails. Um, I hope no one's here with an interest to prevent trail development in Hopkinton. Is there anybody here with that interest? If there is, we need to know where you're setting. Um, the, uh, um, I, it's without a doubt. Uh, one of the things that makes Hopkinton and gives Hopkinton the character that Hopkinton has, which is uh, uh, a rural community inside 495, um, uh, heavily forested, uh, and uh, with, uh, uh, with a trail system that is uh, uh, well developed, but with great opportunities for expansion. Um, our trail system and those of us that actively work in the development and promotion of trails in Hopkinton believe that trails should be um, for all types of recreation, uh, equestrian, uh, biking, uh, walking, running, uh, skiing, snowshoeing, uh, pretty much anything except motorized. There are some trails that do allow some motorized, um, but I think that most of us that, uh, that advocate in the area believe that it is a non-motorized um, uh, trail system here in Hopkins. Um, we, we also uh, oftentimes talk about the value of trails to development and development to trails. So uh, realtors uh, uh, tell us and write about the importance of access to trails as a buying motive for, uh, for home buyers uh, in, uh, uh, in America and particularly in eastern Massachusetts. And, uh, and so uh, 
a as we talk with developers about uh, providing open space so that we can develop trails through their development or near their development or from their development to connect to the existing trails in our community, um, we, um, we emphasize the value of that to the potential home buyer. Trails are, um, uh, are great for uh, our bird watching friends, which there are many in town. Um, uh, trails are a great exercise and recreation uh, resource. Um, and uh, as we are seeing with the development that's happening around the school area, trails could potentially um, be a uh, a resource to get kids to school, not via bus, and not via sidewalks and a long walk. So, um, so there are big advantages to promoting trails, and that's really what our little club does: is we promote and advocate for trails in Hopkinton and the surrounding areas. And our trails are recognized. We. Uh, uh, we've had people from, we, we routinely have people from outside of Hopkinton that join us for our monthly trail hikes. The Trails Club organizes uh, uh, one trail hike uh, per month on a weekend, Saturday or Sunday, usually starting sometime mid-morning. Uh, and uh, we try to concentrate on walking trails uh, in Hopkinton, but uh, routinely take uh, uh, one or two months and go outside of Hopkinton to a neighboring community and walk their trail. We learn things about the way their trails are maintained, constructed, and marked, and that helps us as, uh, as we work on developing more trails uh, in Hopkinton. There's a, a, a point up here about the, uh, uh, the open space recreation plan from 2013 that identified uh, trails, linking of trails, and parking um, as being uh, one of the critical success factors uh, in, the, uh, in uh, the development of our community and the planning of our community. So with that, are, are you going to change the slides to Robert's? Yeah. Robert, we'd like to welcome you. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, we're looking forward uh, to this presentation. We have a lot of work to do in Hopkinton to catch up to where you've gotten to in Hollis. I had a bit of a head start. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter had asked me to give a talk about the Hollis and Upper Charles Trail um, and talk about uh, what we've done so far, what we need to do in the future, and how we went about doing it. And it's quite a story that's gone on for over 20 years. Um, and what I can do is um, start off with the map, the trail map, which is very similar to the map uh, which they can't see on camera, but um, there's a regional trail map that was originally uh, Holliston was one of the first ones who were planning to do a basically a two-mile section of the Upper Charles Trail. Um, Conrail was the then owner of the railroad company, and they were planning on <coughs> donating the, the land to uh, the town of Holliston. And so we actually were the one, first one started, but CSX took over the railroad, and that forced us into a long 13-year time lag before we can actually uh, acquire the land from CSX in order to move forward. Um, let's see. We advanced these. It, Peter, help. I think I'll have to do it. <clears throat> Want to go to full screen mode? Is there a way? Uh, I couldn't make it do that. Okay. All right. So we'll just go with what we have here. Yeah, just go to. Uh, this Um, but this is uh, a discussion about the Upper Charles Trail, and this is actually the last piece uh, that we're working on currently. There's construction ongoing on that, what we call the eight-arch bridge 
locally. How do I advance it, Peter? Sorry. <laughs> I'm getting a message box in there. Which one? This one the left side? Yeah. No. All right. But anyway, we'll do the, first ma the first plan that I have here is the <laughs> the regional trail map. And, and as I mentioned, Hollison was one of the first uh, uh, to start the Upper Charles Trail. And that was a two-mile section in the southern end of the town. Um, this is the town of Holliston, shown with the dark line. Uh, next to that is Milford, Hopkinton, Ashland, and then uh, a little bit of Sherborne has a piece of what was uh, originally planned to be part of the Upper Charles Trail is a 26-mile loop uh, trail that was supposed to use three different railroad corridors as part of the, the plan. Unfortunately, Towns such as Ashland and Hopkinton have lost a lot of your corridor. Uh, it's been sold off through the years, and th th those sections of, of railroad bed were abandoned uh, many years before, whereas Holliston and Milford had sections of the rail bed that were still actively used, even when I moved into town 29 years ago. Um, but the, um, the, the Holliston section is about 6.5, 6.7 miles, and uh, that's shown in the magenta color, which is stone dust. Uh, the green is the section in, in uh, Milford, which you're familiar with, is a paved trail. And then uh, you can see the magenta color. I didn't quite get the Echo Trail. This is an older map. Um, the Echo Trail is a small section over by Echo Lake. Um, and then, but you do see parts of the uh, magenta color is the uh, center trail. Um, and hopefully someday those will all be linked together. And then um, when you consider uh, the, the discussion about trail connections, you not only want to connect people, you know, residences to these trails, but you also want to have regional connections. And so looking at this, uh, this map here, you see it may be fairly light, but you see the green color are all the various open space lands within uh, Holliston, and, and some of them are actually shown in Hopkinton as well. And the red lines, the faint lines, are the, um, the, the, the hiking type trails, uh, whereas we're uh, in Holliston, what we're talking about tonight is, is the uh, Upper Charles Trail, which is a multi-use trail. Um, Peter had asked the question, what's been done? We have over six miles of stone dust trail has been put down in the town of Holliston out of the 6.7 miles. Um, and we have uh, a number of old railroad bridges as well as the, what we uh, cattle passes. What they used to do is have these cattle passes go underneath the railroad to keep the uh, cattle, probably sheep, uh, from going across the railroad itself. And so we have a number of those cattle passes that have railings. Uh, we've put up, actually this is an old, uh, on Saturday we had a scout build another bridge. So we're up to five bridges that now have railings as of last Saturday. Um, and we've done some other landscape improvements. Uh, that one in the upper right corner is the Blair Square in the downtown area of Holliston, where the right of way was actually a little bit wider, and that enabled us to be able to do a little small parklet. Um, we do have plans in the future for, for making more improvements uh, to that. Um, th so we have done the Blair Square Park landscape improvements along the way. Various uh, volunteers have helped with that. We had a storybook walk, which is um, one of the scouts put in. A, uh, a series of uh, four by four posts with panels on it where they mount uh, laminated books for children to read. And so they'll have, I think there's 16 or 20 stations for the books so the children can walk along the trail, get a little exercise and read a book at the same time. And so that's been a, a great success and part of the trail as well. We have other um, areas where we're having um, amenities. We have a bench program where you can buy a bench and uh, like a memorial bench or something like that and have it installed on the trail and then signage. Um, and what we have to do, what's to be done in the future, in the upper right hand corner, this is an artist's interpretation of what the railing will look like uh, when it's completed. Um, the uh, eight arch bridge, as I had mentioned, is under construction now. There's a huge crane that's now putting down precast concrete panels to replace the uh, granite slab that was on top of the railroad originally that had been falling apart. So part of that uh, construction was to uh, basically preserve the bridge because since that concrete cap had all kinds of cracks in it, water was getting down into the granite structure 
and causing damage. And so preserving the bridge by putting a new concrete cap on and then putting up a railing system, as you can see there, with the black. And so um, that is underway, and we're hoping to have that all completed by the end of May, roughly, at which time we'll then finish the last quarter mile of stone dust surfaces that leads up to that. We left that off as part of the last construction. Um, so that's yet to be done. Uh, for safety improvements, um, we've been, we purchased a number of the rapid flashing beacons. If you're familiar with um, some of the signals that you have, I guess over by the high school, they're solar panels. They, they, they're great, very, I would say inexpensive uh, in terms of uh, lighting that is a very uh, safety oriented to be able to push a button and have this very visible rapid flashing beacon. And we've purchased a number of those. They just haven't yet been installed. We had to, uh, we purchased it right before the, the snow and, and uh, haven't been able to get out there and do that. As I mentioned, we have a number of uh, bridges and cattle passes, and uh, we have another scout who's working two weeks from now to put up another uh, section of railing along the bridges, um, various uh, other amenities, whistle posts. You can see here, uh, the, that was a notification for the engineer to blow the whistle when they're coming to an intersection. Um, and so we're restoring those by painting them up and making them look nice. And then we have another project, uh, different groups doing different things. One is doing an interpretive signage. They're going through and looking through the history of the railroad and then have some interpretive signage along the way. Um, when I'll talk about how it's been done, like I say, it's been a, over a 20 year process. Um, what I'll talk about is one of the key aspects is getting your support and getting partners to help you get this uh, project uh, gone through. Um, then I'll talk about the acquisition, what we had to do for that, design and permitting, funding and construction. Those are the steps that we had to go through in order to, uh, to make this happen. Um, I can't stress enough the, the, the need for support. Um, when this project first started, it was actually before I was involved with it, the Upper Charles Conservation is a local land trust that uh, you have your Hopkinton Area Land Trust there's, uh, that serves the town of Holliston and a few of the other towns is the Upper Charles Conservation Land Trust. And they had initially um, taken the idea, it was uh, my boss, uh, former boss, he's now retired, uh, John Thomas had, had taken the idea of, of that first section of the trail that I had mentioned in the southern part of the town and connecting it with these other towns. And so he went around to all these different towns to get support for that and, and to get commitments from the selectmen and letters of support. And from that point, I then took over. John stopped uh, uh, supporting this project, and so I took over and, and it went around with basically plans similar to this, walking around to all uh, various uh, stakeholders and you know neighbors we had discussions we had public meetings at the library we would meet with garden club the planning board the conservation commission uh, historical society uh, alliance clubs and i just went around and and got letters of support from all those and that uh, became a matrix of all the letters of support for various projects along the way so i have hundreds of letters of support that helped when we go after grants to be able to say yes, we have all these people who are supporting the project. And that's a key aspect that I think you need to, to consider as you go forward with your uh, Upper Charles Trail sections in, in Hopkinton. Um, we got uh, support from the state legislators way back. Um, they helped us get grants. Um, we then you know, got approval at town meeting. And so we basically said, let's vote this at town meeting that we want to convert. We didn't own the land, but we wanted to be able to convert the, the railroad to Upper Charles Trail, so we got commitment at town meeting to be able to have authorization for the selectmen to go forward, whatever steps are necessary to acquire the land, design it, permit it, build it, and maintain it. Um, once we, uh, uh, well, I, I'm jumping ahead to the design and permitting, there's the acquisition phase of it, but the design and permitting, um, we have a trails committee that was established by the selectmen. Once we got town meeting approval, the, um, the, the, uh, they call it the Holliston Trails Committee, and we had members on our committee. I'm a landscape architect who works for a civil engineering firm. There was another person uh, who was a wetland scientist 
who helped out with all the permitting. He would do the wetland mapping, the wetland uh, notice of intent applications that we would do. So this was all done basically pro bono. And, and I, as I say, I worked for an engineering surveying company. And so we had, I was able to leverage some of the uh, surveyors in our office to be able to support uh, some of the plans and some of the um, survey that was needed uh, for that. But we did it all in house without having to do a contracted services for the design and the permitting for, and, and it was done in pieces. And so all along the way, we, as we would do sections, we would do different permits for each, each piece as we went along. Um, from a funding standpoint, as I had mentioned, get your support from your state legislators. That is very helpful. We had uh, two bond bills that were established for the trail. One was an environmental bond bill, one was a transportation bond bill, and one we used for construction, one we used for acquisition, and that was very uh, helpful for that. Um, we also, in the town of Holliston, we have a Community Preservation Act, which is a, um, a, a tax on the, on the land that then gets put into a pot of money that can be used for various resources. Um, so we were able to secure some CPC funding, Community Preservation Committee uh, funding uh, for that. Uh, we also had a Friends of the Holliston Trails group, which is a 401c3 that we had established that did fundraising activities and then they would help support um, uh, acquisition of, of um, like the rapid flashing beacons and that sort of thing for, for parts of the trail. We got other uh, sources of funds along the way. Uh, Bikes Belong, um, Celebrate Holliston is a group in town that helped fund uh, pieces of the trail. The, the Lions Club in Holliston uh, provided funding. Charles River Wheelman helped one of the bridges uh, provide us some funding for that. As I mentioned, we went to town meeting. We used very little money other than the CPC funds, but very little money uh, from the town itself in order to build this project. Greenways grant, NEMBA actually gave us uh, some funding at one point, so it's, it's a lot of different sources uh, through those years. Um, the next part is how it's been done. Uh, even before we owned the land, uh, CSX, the railroad company, allowed us to do, go out there and maintain the trail in order to cut back the vegetation because many, it was almost impassable when we first started. There were trees growing up in the middle of the rail bed at one point, um, uh, but we've, uh, leveraged over 600 different people, um, 7,000 hours of volunteer time, actual physical labor. No, I'm not talking meetings and all this other. I'm talking 7,000 hours of actual physical labor, cutting back the vegetation, um, uh, helping uh, to pull out the railroad ties and various projects along the way. Um, we've had corporate groups, REI, uh, had one time they had an activity where they had 100 people come out to the trail. It was phenomenal. You know, we had, we had quite a bit. MathWorks, every year they've been doing a project for us, like maintaining uh, some of the vegetation. Deloitte is another group. Uh, New England Waterworks as well. And picking up trash or cleaning uh, uh, some of the ditches, uh, the, those tend to fill in. Uh, the railroad had these ditches on each side of the, the rail bed. Um, we have volunteer groups, church groups, Lions Club. As I had mentioned, uh, scouts have been a great resource for a lot of the projects, and I know you have scouts doing a lot of the projects in your town. We've had over 12 Eagle Scout candidates who eventually became Eagle Scouts uh, with their projects on the rail trail itself. Um, and then we also get some of the professionals along the way. Um, when it got to the construction of the surfaces, making the improvements, uh, we have both uh, donated services. There was a, a contractor who lives in town who uh, donated a lot of his time and his equipment to be able to do some of the grading, but we also contracted the services. And so you'll see here, uh, there's a road grader that would um, basically scrape the, the, the gravel smooth, and then we would uh, have, we, we would bring it in in truckloads of good sized truckloads of uh, stone dust. You can see the truck is backing up. They fill the hopper uh, with stone dust and use a paving machine to actually put down a nice uh, three inch layer of stone dust and then it gets rolled with a vibratory roller. And so we were doing that to make a good um, surface and it's very uh, good for accessibility purposes in terms of, uh, you know, we, we get uh, people in wheelchairs uh, that are able to use the trail. Um, 
other construction, the highway department has been super uh, and helpful and you know, they've been taking down some of the big trees that we can't handle and they've also installed a lot of the pedestrian signals. We've had uh, a, a local stonemason install stone wall and some pillars, you know, just to make a nice amenity along the way. We've had uh, a landscape business that donated materials and actually helped uh, install at various locations. Scouts have done things. The Garden Club has donated trees. But it's all been volunteer. There's so much volunteer help that has gone into to making this, pro, uh, this uh, trail possible. Uh, bench program, as I mentioned, the Friends of Holliston Trails pays for the benches and the uh, Holliston Highway Department will actually install it. Um, I had mentioned Blair Square, which is in the downtown center of town. Um, that area was, it, it basically happened overnight. It was just like somebody's idea came along and said, hey, can we do something in the downtown area? It was a real eyesore. And so uh, overnight, we started the next day, we cut down trees. Uh, we had a contractor come out with loam and filled you know, the area with soil. Um, the downtown Marigold project funded various aspects in terms of plantings and amenities along there, but it was all done volunteers uh, and no cost to the town, basically. Um, and we've had others like scouts install the signs, a kiosk, uh, dog waste stations that has become a, a significant need because we have the, the, uh, the Mudville section of Hollison, which has a lot of residents, and they all, so many people used to walk their dogs on the streets, now they come up onto the trail. And so we, that was a real need to have dog waste stations. And so that was uh, uh, paid for by the Friends of and installed by Scouts. Um, this is just a slide of the, 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 the funding to, to date, the total being uh, roughly 3.2 million. The majority of that was spent for the, the land cost. That was um, probably over 2 million of the, of the 3 million was basically for land costs. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, we were able to secure some bond bills. The uh, DCR one at the top, 800,000, that was actually a bond bill, but then it was given to the DCR to administer through to the town of Holliston. Um, but we also did, as uh, Peter has done, a recreational trails grant program using DCR funds, and we used that for a lot of the stone dust materials and the gravel materials to pay for that. That's fairly short money. Um, you know, you can get like $50,000 per grant. We were lucky that we were, had all the permits in place and uh, the DCR said, hey, we have some money left over, could you use it? And I said, yeah, we can use another $45,000. So they gave us 95 that one year. So that was, that was nice. Um, and, but various sources, uh, we've gotten funding for that. But uh, the, the surfaces themselves have been uh, very inexpensive. Uh, we were able to build an, an average cost of, I think it was about $40,000 per mile. Um, compare that to uh, the, the paved alternative, something like Milford is doing. That current design, you know, with having paved trails, multi-use trails, is like sometimes $2 million a mile. And so we're able to do it for very low costs with a lot of sweat equity, but um, the material and the surfaces are fairly inexpensive. Um, as I mentioned, we just, these are just a series of slides and images of what it looked like and how it became what it became. But uh, you can see there we had lots of volunteers uh, cleaning scouts, uh, doing projects along the way, Lions clubs, various volunteers, Lend the Lion program. Again, Lend the Lion doing lots of cleanup. This was an Eagle Scout project where they actually removed, you can see, the remnants of the ties, there was a section of the rail bed where the ties were still there. And so that you'd see these, these uh, various hummocks along the way were actually railroad ties. And so this uh, Eagle Scout candidate got a whole group of people out there and they actually moved the ties and, and, and uh, removed them for us. And that, that's uh, a lot of the trash and debris that we found along the way. Uh, we've had scouts install kiosks that were very helpful for orientation purposes and putting maps in there, and this happens to be one at Blair Square. And there's another view of the kiosk, and we have a local sign maker who makes the signs for us. Um, he does it all for free, gives us the sign. We just have an Eagle Scout install the posts and then attach them. Landscape improvements. 
Uh, sometimes we needed the professionals. As I mentioned, Tree Specialist is a uh, uh, arborist in town who has helped us phenomenally. There are a lot of trees that needed to come down or they've fallen down and become problematic. Uh, this happens to be in the Phipps Tunnel area, if anybody's been near that tunnel in Holliston. Uh, large trees that they were able to climb up there and get somehow. More professional support. This happens to be one of the guys who uh, has a construction firm and equipment in town willing to donate his services. Uh, this is one of the, in the downtown Mudville area, uh, what had happened was a, over the years since it was abandoned corridor, it became a real mess. And so it became a hazard. This is, as I said, one uh, bridge that uh, was falling down. There was big gaps in it. It was a real safety hazard. We had a, uh, that construction company, Herb Brockert and CSC, install concrete walls, and then he f welded personally welded all these steel framework that was then attached to the railroad ties, which then um, we then attached all the wooden railing to. It was a phenomenal project, and I can't believe all the time that he spent welding every one of these steel conduits that, that make up that bridge. If you're ever in that area, take a close look at his, his welding work. It's phenomenal. All done by volunteers. Um, this is like a before and after picture. as. Since it was an abandoned corridor, we had a lot of dirt bikes and quads riding on it, which then cut off a lot of the drainage ditches, which then allowed the water to go into the middle of the trail, which uh, made a real mess. And so we had to grade it off, level it off, bring up gra gravel in there, raise it up, and then put stone dust on top of that. But you can see the before and after. Again, another section that was totally underwater almost nine months out of the year, we're able to uh, now make a usable trail out of it. Phipps Tunnel, I sort of joke about this one. Um, I had never seen the Phipps Tunnel without water in it or mud. And we finally, we put in, we made some improvements to the pipes. Um, and then that still didn't solve it. What was happening was the groundwater was coming up into the tunnel and still keeping everything wet. And so we ended up putting in, you could just barely see the uh, white pipes, which is a perforated drain, which uh, catch, captures the groundwater as it rises in the tunnel and then conveys it off to the ditches downstream. So I, I joke that this is the first time since 1847 that that, that uh, tunnel is dry, but it truly is. Um, as I mentioned, the downtown Blair Square was a real eyesore. It was all overgrown and uh, quite, a, quite a mess. And that first day, the, this guy says, hey, can you do something? So then, you know, the next day we were out there, it was on Sunday, uh, that one photograph where I showed the Lend Alliance at the tunnel, that's when this guy came out and he says, hey, can we do something tomorrow? So we went out the next day and cut those trees and that was the, the start of it all and then graded it off, inserted loam, and that, what you see today. And the, the rewards of it is, um, you know, how many people use it. It is phenomenal. We, as I mentioned last Saturday, we had a scout install the railing. And it was just, you would see these groups of people go through. There was a high school uh, running club, or I guess the cross country team were running on the trail. There was a group of about 10, and then you'd see a pack of uh, bicyclists, I don't know what group they were, but it, the rewards is seeing the many people that use these trails. And they're more likely to use a multi-use trail than they would be, say, a hiking trail, uh, because it's flat, it's accessible, more age group from all different ages can use it. Um, and it's just, that happened to be a, uh, a birthday party um, in the Blair Square. One year we had uh, music at the, at the gazebo um, they're sort of conflicted with other music that was going on, so we haven't done that since, but we have a lot of activities start uh, at the Blair Square itself. That becomes a, a community uh, a spot to, to congregate and start for trail walks. If anybody's been here on uh, first night, we have uh, in the Phipps Tunnel, we bring a generator and light up the tunnel. The scouts cook hot dogs and have hot apple cider. Um, we have fire pits all along the trail. Um, so you can get warm. Uh, this year we had to cancel it and we ended up having it in February because of all the cold and the snow. Uh, but we ended up having it. But um, That's just my contact information if anybody has questions. And now I can turn it to Peter if you want to go for it. Do you want the pointer or anything? No, before you do that, I just want to uh, oh, come on. give you a little something. I thought it was there. This is from Outlook Farm, but this is for obviously helping with presentation. It's cheese and really a pretty incredible kielbasa. It's totally personal favorite. This is chickpea and 
primary fill box. This is this is a really great. But thank you for. Could we do just a couple of questions? Yeah. Sure. We'll do questions. Yeah. We'll cover this, and then yeah, we'll do a couple of questions. But I just want to say, Robert has helped. You know, not just through this presentation, but on every step of the way on the, the trail work that we've done in, in Hopkins. And while we're working for Fields and Thomas, and you know, certainly we do the proposal invoice. You know, contract services. There's always a walk beforehand, at least one, usually two or three, that don't kind of show up on the bill. So I really appreciate all that effort. Is that a few questions? On? Yeah, just. No, I, there was actually a lot of resistance to it in the beginning. Um, we had, it was funny, I was um, just recently, I was with one of the Lions who was, a, um, who was a selectman and he was with the Finance Committee and he admitted that he fought me tooth and nail when he was on the Finance Committee uh, to vote against it when it went before town meeting and then again when he was a selectman to vote against it. And so, um, I think, you know, like I say, the, the process that I went through was to go around and talk about how each individual group, whether it was a historic society, and just point out that, hey, we can protect this resource, protect the eight arch bridge. If we just didn't build this trail, I guarantee you that eight arch bridge would fall down. Um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, but in any event, um, getting their support, you know, the interest in historical issues and so that, you know, they would have historic interpretive exhibits along the way to, to actually celebrate the, you know, the, the, the railroad history and get people out there to see it all. Um, and so there was a long process of getting support uh, for that. And I think the, one of the best things that we did, we were originally going to build the first section, which was in the southern end of town, sort of by itself. Um, and we decided against that when we were purchasing the land. We said, let's buy what's in the downtown area. So the Mudville area, that section that runs from Blair Square basically to Cross Street. And so we bought that. That was 1.3 miles. And that's a perfect distance for people to walk. And especially when you have a downtown area, you have um, a, a lot of residents that live within a quarter mile of the, of the trail itself. And so the smartest thing we did was build that first 1.3 miles and get everybody to say, hey, we love this, we want more. And so that's then sparked, uh, you know, more interest in it. And, and, and there was, you know, even 15 years ago, 10 years ago, there was a lot of opposition to trails. Every, oh, we lose our privacy. You know, it's, it's people in my backyard. Well, no, it's not your, really your backyard, you know. And, and so there's, there's so much angst about what could happen. And the, the, the best person that I've ever spoken to in all the years was the police chief in Milford. He says, if anything, it's the, all these eyes and ears that are out on the trail are a benefit to the police to be able to, to talk about things that are going on, to be able to stop crime. And, and I won't get into the details of what he told me, but there, there was a lot of crime that has been cleaned up as a result of all the eyes and ears on the trail itself. Um, but none of those things, and he's the best person, the police chief in Milford, to be able to tell you that none of those things, that they heard the same story. It's going to be crime, theft, everything is going to come along with the trail. Well, no, people don't steal televisions and go into houses from bikes, you know, on, on rail trails. And so initially there was a lot of opposition once we uh, built the trail. It, they, everybody wanted more and more, and so they were able to support it. Any other questions? Yes. Well, one of the fundraising activities is the is the bench program, and so for a certain donation, you would be able to buy a bench, and some of that money goes towards the the, the donation. Um, there was another. Um, when the eight arch bridge was being talked about uh, initially there was a, a a woman who started a uh, fundraising for that activity and she engaged the schools and so they had like artwork projects where the kids would um, do artwork and then they would sell it or donate it or you know go at i think there was an auction one time uh, for artwork and and so then there was another 
somebody had uh, made a poster of the Eight Arch Bridge and sold that, and so that you can actually buy at Fisk's if you head downtown. Um, but there's a you know the Eight Arch Bridge artwork uh, that was uh, done. Um, other activities that the Friends of do, they have um, a run. There's a fun run coming up. I think it's in June, uh, June 10th, uh, where they you know generate some funds from from uh, I think it's a 5K run. Um, all different types of activities for fundraising. Uh, actually, the REI I reached out many years ago. I haven't discussed it with them for many years, but that was uh, quite a few years ago when the first time uh, they they donated. I think it was ten thousand dollars to the to the trail, which is not insignificant. I think uh, the check was uh, shown on one of the slides. Um, and then MathWorks has been mainly supporting with what they do is they have a work group where the this MathWorks will pay their employees to take a day of doing good work uh, for a town and in our case I think they had about 15 to 20 people um, working on it and they've done it like three years in a row but that person actually approached me or the trails committee um, because he lived in town he worked for MathWorks and said hey we have this uh, activity and same thing with Deloitte they're in a uh, consultants and and they wanted to do a uh, impact day they call it and so a person that lived in town that said hey you know could you use some help sure you know so okay any other questions or This works, and I just didn't black up the screen. Here we go. Peter, we lost a couple of our audience members. They needed to leave to go to the Upper Charles Trails Committee. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, I mean, you've heard a lot about the value of trails already, so I won't go broad brush on it, but I did want to kind of briefly talk about sort of three items that come up. Trails as a health resource, trails to enhance safety, and that's becoming, I think, a more and more critical aspect of things. We've lost a couple of people in bike accidents here in town, um, you know, and, and trails are a way to, to separate bikers and cars, and then obviously connectivity. Um, I like this picture not only because my son Sam is in the middle and I'm not sure quite what he's doing and unfortunately he's not here yet because this would really embarrass him. He's 13 so that would be about perfect. But I think this picture also shows all those aspects. It's obviously kids being outside is, is important for health. Safety, you don't have to worry about cars there. Wouldn't you be embarrassed by that, Sam? Thank you. And then finally, connectivity. I think many of you, most of you probably know, this is the center trail and it connects the schools with the downtown area. And that's important for, and you, you see kids in the morning walking that path and then folks from town can, can get to the schools and to the loop road and, and elsewhere. Let's see if this will, well, we'll go to the, so health resources, there's the obvious exercise that one gets out of, out of that, running, dog walking, biking, but you also are out in nature in, in these trails. And there are little short stretches of trails, but they're in the woods, they're near downtown areas, and so fairly quickly you can get out and kind of get into nature. And I think, again, it's something that we're finding more and more, there's this huge value to people in being out in nature, having a contact with nature, and also in terms of stress reduction as a, as a result of that. 
safety. Um, you know, as I said before, keeping cars away from bikers, away from runners is pretty important. I noticed myself as someone who runs regularly, I've, I've had people veering off, um, too many people on their, on their handheld devices while driving. Um, it's also a safe zone for kids to be exploring. Um, unfortunately, in this case, somebody got hold of his father's cell phone, but I could also, wasn't worried having him on the trail like that, sitting beside the trail. It's a safe space for kids. In terms of connectivity, what this map is, which is a little hard to see from that, but we've got, um, you can get this online, um, and I know Beals and Thomas was involved in this process. This is Needham. There's also a map online for Wellesley, and then Lexington also has their Across Lexington program. And what these are is ways of connecting the green spaces to city streets and across the town so that you can find a trail system that gets you, allows you to connect across the, tra the town. In Hopkinton, we have a little bit of that starting, but I think it's important to kind of always keep that in your back of your mind. So this is the center trail here. It connects up to the high school, the middle school, the Hopkins school, connects to the downtown area. There's another trail that runs off to the west there over to Lumber Street, and ideally at some point that becomes a multi-use trail. Um, these are things that we can be thinking about. We can also see there's a pretty high density there. If we can connect those neighborhoods to the schools, to other commercial areas, to the downtown, it just increases the potential for people to get from one place to another without getting in their car. And that obviously has health benefits. It also has benefits in terms of traffic flow for cars as well. So, with all that as kind of a backdrop as to why we're doing what we're doing, progress in 2017 in Hopkinton. Really two major projects got done. One was the middle school cross country course. That was a course, really was sort of the brainchild of Tim Kilduff of the 26.2 Foundation. And as Tim typically does, he drags people in who actually do the work for him. Um, and that was me. And Ryan Davenport is another person in town. And so we did a lot of the planning. We sat down with the cross country coaches, with the schools, and, and kind of worked out a program. Tim got the funding for us through the BAA and the 26.2 Foundation. And there was a, a program where BAA pays the town to park the buses there on Marathon Day, and that's where this money came from. It was money that was originally used to build the track, but then Tim wanted to make sure that money kept getting directed towards things that were sort of a running related, but also a benefit to the town. So that's where that money came from. In terms of the things we talked about as goals, clearly here we have health resource, safety issues in terms of off-road running. I mean, the kids can run on that course, and you'll see a lot of them training on that course. I know the coaches have set up some loops for, for work. Right now, you still see the kids running a lot through the center of town. Again, with what I was talking about earlier about people not paying as much attention, if they can be running more on trails in the woods and also on soft surfaces, that's going to be beneficial for them. Um, connectivity, this middle school course connects to the center trail, so that's a, that's a positive there. The Echo Trail down at the southern end of town was funded sort of the same way that Roberts was funded, which was, at, I think we were actually at a middle school cross-country conservation commission hearing getting the permitting done in place for that when we found out that the state had this extra money kicking around. And, we applied for a grant working with uh, Upper Charles Trail and Ken Park, who was chairman at the time, for about $50,000, which is what their limit was for the year before, but we didn't get it, but we were sort of shortlisted. And so they said, gee, if you guys can get this done by December 31st, 2017, you can have the money. So we said, sure, we can, we can do that. And then we had to jump through a lot of hoops to, to get it done in that short time period. And again, Robert was very helpful in, in moving that forward. 
That section of trail is, is on old rail bed. The town had already bought the land, again, through the Upper Charles Trail Committee. Um, so we had that piece of rail bed, so we were able to go ahead and apply for that money and put a multi-use path down fairly quickly. Um, I tend to use, um, under, under state contracting rules, you can sole source up to $10,000 for one contractor. Above that, it's got to go out to bid. Um, so I've been using local contractors up to that max of $10,000. And that, to me, that works really well because if you're using local folks, they tend to have a, a vested interest in making sure it works well. And you probably tend to get more bang for your buck doing that versus if you bid this as a, to a bigger, pro as a bigger project, you're going to be, you know, some large company's small project where they're, they're going to be training their engineers on. And I'd prefer to be using the guys who have their own piece of equipment doing their own work. And as I say, it's, it's worked really well so far, um, you know, but doing these small bite-sized pieces has, has worked well. Um, again, in terms of the, the three goals, it's an out and back course, but certainly it's in a beautiful area. You're walking by um, Echo Lake, so you can see that lake, in, and certainly in the fall, but other times of year too, you know, the summer, that, that lake sparkling in the distance is really nice. Safety, again, people walking their dogs. People have already started walking their dogs on a more regular basis down there. You see a lot more people out there. Much safer than walking on the side of the road. There, there's not much connectivity right now, but there's a potential to connect down to the Milford Trail. There's a piece of property in between that we've talked to the town about perhaps purchasing. The town master plan calls for a sidewalk all the way down to Milford along Hayden Row Street. And with that in place in this trail, that would get us down across from Milford. So I think we're actually reasonably close to that with, with a few steps that need to be taken. This also connects to neighborhoods and some work that we're doing in the future, and we'll talk about that a little further along. So here's the middle school cross country course, just to show you where it is. Probably all familiar with the track. This trail was somewhat interesting in that it's a bit of a public private partnership deal. This is not town owned land but it was pretty essential to have that piece of property. Um, so I have a, an agreement with the owner to use, to use that land for the trail. Um, and he was fine with that, so we've got a written okay. He's also planning at some point on donating it, donating it to the town, so he really doesn't need that or plan on using that for development. There's a fair bit of wetlands down in there too. It goes down to the center trail, which is along here, and then we did work up along the edge. Um, in this area, there's, we sort of found as we were going through there this really neat, probably 200-year oak tree, um, what the foresters call a lone wolf tree, because it was built, it was sort of stood on its own, so it was able to grow out in all directions evenly. Um, typically, farmers would leave those just on a fence along a fence row might be the area where they, you know, rest and the, eat their lunch because otherwise it was pretty hard, pretty hot. Because you got to remember, most of these areas were just completely cleared of trees, you know, 150 years ago. So having that old tree there is, is really kind of neat. We didn't even know it was there until I started clearing, and it was one of those situations where you're clearing for it and you look up and you go, wow, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. So here's just a couple of pictures. This is going down through the, through the woods. Um, nice gradual slope to it. And that's the other side that runs along the loop road. On the work on this side, we've got a little bit of a, a drainage issue right now. Um, I actually talked to the contractors and they're putting this in and say, boy, don't we want to go a little bit higher with the, we put a base layer of, of sort of road base material and they said, no, this should be fine. And I decided partially through timing, but partially because of this to say, you know what, let's leave it in place. We'll put the, the stone dust surface down this spring and just make sure that that drainage isn't a problem. Well, it is a problem. 
and now, but now we know where the water goes and we can divert it around the trail and, and act, in some ways it's actually valuable to know that. So we'll fix that and get that finished up for this spring. Um, but that is a nice, quite a nice resource. And, and my son runs for the cross country team and that was a middle school team and, and what we've created with this course is, is now running snobs because they went and ran, I think it was Dedham, and they said, this course is all pavement. We might as well be running the Timlin. So Ryan Davenport, the other person who worked on this, that was one of his key goals, was to have kids know what a real cross-country course not running on roads looks like. And, and I think we've accomplished this. We may have created a monster. <laughs> yeah, that was 13 years ago. Um, this is the other trail, Echo Trail. Um, you can see my incredible skill with PowerPoint. Um, but I also did want to sort of show just the kind of plans that we use in preparing this. And you know, it, these aren't just dirt paths that are, you know, I, I hand sketch something and tell the contractors to get after it. There's a lot of upfront work that goes into, into preparing this, into going through the Conservation Commission and getting the right permitting. Um, in order to make this happen, in order to know what needs to be done. So Echo Trail is interesting in terms of how straight it is. Um, and you can see here's, here's where we'd want to ultimately be connecting out. But um, again, with, as far as pictures, the, the lake is over on this side. This is the same bale you can see in both pictures. You're just standing on different sides of it. But you can see. This is looking south, and that's looking north. And I don't think you'll find a straighter trail <laughs> anywhere. You can see down that trail a full half mile. And we've cleared all the trees out as we need to, but boy, it, it looks, you know, if you're walking on the trail and someone else is walking on the trail, you can see them almost anywhere on that trail. It's not like the center, the center trail, oddly enough, has small curves, but enough curves that you really can't see people the whole way. This one, you can see them the whole way. Having said that, you can still walk in this trail and feel like you're out in the woods and you've got the, the lake off on one side. It's really quite a nice trail if you haven't been down there. We do have three parking spots in the end and then other than that, we're, we're putting parking at 192 at the Hughes property, 192 Hayden Road Street. So for 2018, and these are really, should be reversed, but I'll keep them in this order. Cross country course was done in two phases. The first phase was middle school, which we've, we've completed, except for the top coating. And then we also have a high school piece that we're gonna do. Also funded by the same organization, the BAA in 26.2. And again, some of the same connectivity, same health resources, same safety issues. And again, having just additional length of trail that the kids can run on, stay on the school campus, and not be running in the streets, I think is, is a valuable thing, particularly in this day and age. Um, the Hughes Trail is on property, again, that the town purchased for, the, for active and passive recreation. And we're actually in the process of getting that permitted now. We've gone to the Conservation Commission with a notice of intent. Um, that hearing was continued. I think we're on early May. And hopefully that gets finished then, and then we can get going on the actual construction. We have about $55,000 for that. That's probably not going to be enough to put the whole coat down in terms of, of stone dust, but I think we can get an awful lot of the trail in for that. Um, it's a half mile off-road multi-use path. It's a little narrow in sections because this is, rather than being built on um, an old rail bed, this is being built on an old cart path, so a farm path. Um, we've got some issues with grading that needs to be done to make sure that it's Americans with Disabilities Act ADA compliant. Um, so there'll be a fair bit of work and a fair bit of thought process that needs to go into this one. This trail is the start of, I think, some pretty important connections because this starts to connect some neighborhoods um, around that. And as Robert pointed out, there has been certainly some opposition to this trail, but I think once it's in, in, in full shape, you'll see people starting to use it. And who uses trails but people who live in that area? And so some of your 
your biggest opponents realize that A, the sky didn't fall because the trail got put in close to their house, and, and furthermore, boy, it's really nice. You know, I was walking my dog in the street and I almost got hit by a car for the fourth time this month, and all of a sudden I can walk on this trail and don't even have to worry about it. I can, you know, not in Hopkinton, of course, but let the dog off a leash. So just to show where the cross-country course is, the addition will be inside the loop road, and one of the reasons that we want it there is because a, there's an old rail bed. Here's center trail, the rail bed there. You can see another spur of the rail bed coming out here. But this is old rail bed through there. And the other thing is where we've, I've got that circled, there's a, a really neat pine forest in there. And you can walk into that today and stand in that pine forest with these very, very tall pines. And even though you've got three schools around you and cars whizzing by and the loop road and all sorts of stuff going on, it's, it's tranquil in there. It's, it's very peaceful. And I want that trail to come through there so people can walk into that tranquility. So when they're not, of course, you know, running as hard as they can in a cross country meet. But it, it really is a beautiful area. And that's the idea is to, to have that, to open that up for people. This is the future Hughes multi-use area. This is one of the narrow stretches. It's wetlands on both sides of that, basically right up to the cart path. So we're going to have to be very careful on how we work in that area. Um, this was an old sort of somebody threw some granite blocks down for a bridge. There was initially some thought that that was a an actual historic bridge, but it was historic. Um, you can see the. The actual bridge timbers are there, which were basically all railroad ties. And then in typical farm fashion, when you know they had some granite blocks lying around, they needed to get across that waterway, and the, and the railroad ties had rotted out, so they just moved the granite over. So nothing historic about it. Um, but that's how we're going to access that area. So this, again, is showing that Hughes property. It's a relatively long, narrow piece facing east to west. Um, here's where we're showing that bridge, that initial crossing, and then that line going off there is the trail going out. And this, um, I think, Ken and Robert and I, so that's where it says, prepared by Robert Wideneck. Well, it's, yeah, really probably more Holliston. I don't think you were charging for that. I think that was a, a walk we did. So that's the, and, that allowed us to get on the, we used that map in the, in the application for state money. So again, you know, folks on the trails in the community, in the surrounding communities have really helped us out with this stuff. There's already, a, so the Hughes Trail will stop right around here at the end of the Hughes property. There's already a trail that goes out to Joseph. Um, but I think once this becomes a multi-use trail, there's going to be increased pressure on that other trail to get out to use this trail. And again, as I said, I think with that, people are going to say, gee, this, this really is a, a positive. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Stuart to give a brief synopsis of a, a slightly different use. So hold on a sec. Yep, Gary. Yeah, that was um, at the, the Hughes CONCOM hearing. We were talking to neighbors afterwards, and, and they mentioned, I guess, last summer there were 60 windows smashed, which seems like something that our police force ought to really be focusing on. That's, that's a big problem. Um, we, I mean, we haven't had use of that area yet, so we really don't know whether it's going to be a problem, but I, I think we can certainly put up enough hunting cameras or what have you to make sure that if that does happen, we find out who the perpetrators yeah, I, are. I asked the police about that, and um, it wasn't a, what was it, an overly warm, it wasn't a, it was sort of like, yeah, we talked about it, but the, the no, I don't remember, there was, a, there, was a, there was some reluctance to put cameras up. 
on a personal note, if somebody's got 60 windows, that, that individual has, has a problem and we ought to really be making sure that individual is, is dealt with. That is not, you know, a little vandalism. That's a big problem. And so hopefully they do get after that. On your other, um, so the other question as far as connection to the Milford Trail, so there's, um, my, my dream connection is that we go and we um, go out to 85, go down 85, we own the land um, in front of those new houses that were put in, put a wide driveway that goes down, and then I would love to see a flyover bridge that can meet ADA. Um, I think there's enough room for ADA compliance and is high enough um, to meet the state requirements for, for bridge height. But those sort of pedestrian bridges are not that expensive, uh, under, under $100,000. But from a safety perspective, that would be great. Now, to get that put in by under DOT specs where they want to be able to drive an ambulance over it, now we're talking a couple of million. Um, hopefully, through political discussions and wearing people down, you know, we can convince them that, boy, you know, if, if someone, God forbid, has a heart attack in the furthest point in the bridge, it's still only 200 feet, you know, to get an ambulance to them. So we really don't need a $2 million bridge, a $100,000 bridge will do. So I think there's, there's some of that political discussion that needs to go on. The other option would be in the short term to just go at grade and there's, there is enough line of sight, basically just a little bit south of where the driveway comes out from the Milford parking right now. Uh, there's some water crossings you've got to do there, but that's all doable stuff. Ken? there's no line of sight there. So we actually have no great way to get from the College Road area up to Grand Street. So it's quite possible that we will find a way to get to, uh, to the Echo Trail in order to do that. But we don't know quite how we're going to make that connection yet, or whether it's even possible to do that. So we're mostly making, making, making more progress in the center of town and north of town than we are in the southern center. OK, Stuart. Um, so by way of introduction, uh, Stuart Henner, a uh, local parent, uh, had two boys in town, assistant scoutmaster at Troop 4. Um, as you will notice, not a local. We, we moved to Hopkinton about 11 years ago from Australia. And uh, just to connect it to the story here, um, you know, from my, my town, which is about 26 miles uh, as uh, Hopkinton is here from town, um, we could ride bike paths all the way into Melbourne um, and from Melbourne to other parts of the state. Um, on dedicated bike or bike lane uh, paths associated with the road. So when we got to Hopkinton, we brought our bikes across uh, the pond and um, we we're a little surprised, you know, bike paths weren't quite a, a common thing here, but we found our way and eventually found uh, um, Hopkinton State Park and found the Trails Club and certainly uh, forged um, forged path forward. So I was asked to speak about mountain biking. Um, there are plenty of places to mountain bike uh, in town. Obviously, the, the state park is one of the biggest ones. And then um, the Vietnam uh, property just on the, the border there with, uh, with Milford is probably the second biggest one. But uh, certainly, I ride a number of other trails. Um, I've been on Center Trail. Um, there is, in fact, a trail that runs uh, behind our home in uh, Ash Street uh, that was depicted on one of Peter's charts that uh, goes all the way through the Legacy Farm. 
and there's actually a few more trails in there that we've been uh, maintaining over time. And uh, you know, around Lake Whitehall, um, certainly is a lot of a good, uh, good riding as well. But uh, I'm a member of NEMBA. NEMBA is the New England Mountain Bikers uh, Association. It uh, has 26 chapters in, uh, in the New, New England region. Um, Blackstone Valley is the local chapter. Um, and they actually maintain a lot of the trails uh, in and around uh, our area. So that includes Hopkinton, uh, Ashland, Milford, uh, Upton, um, you know, and associated uh, regions. They, they like to work very much in partnership with the local town, with the local conservation board, trails clubs, wherever you know, the stewards are to maintain uh, open space and accessibility. Um, so you'll notice uh, if you've been monitoring them at all uh, on social media, a, a big push about, you know, please respect wetlands, please respect that it's wet out, the snow's melted, the ground's still soft. So don't go mountain biking when you know you've got to actually damage the trail. They're a big, big fan on keeping um, access open by being very good stewards. Um, but effectively, uh, the two options you have is obviously Hopkinton and um, Vietnam. So Hopkinton State Park has a lot of well-established trails. There's actually probably more trails that aren't actually depicted on the map that have been uh, maintained over time. And uh, one of the things you'll find is clearly people will ride there or walk their dogs um, on their own. But NEMBER actually organises uh, weekly rides throughout the spring, uh, summer and fall season. So every Monday night there's actually an organised ride that will occur in Hopkinton State Park. Um, gen generally depending on how many people turn up, it may be one group of 8 to 15 riders. Um, but if more than that turns up, they tend to split into um, um, you know, capabilities. So slower riders tend to stick together, maybe some faster, more capable riders uh, peel off and that way everyone rides at their comfortable pace. Um, and then on uh, Wednesday nights is actually a, a weekly ride scheduled in Vietnam, which is um, the other section of, of land. But uh, there is a website that you can go to, you can certainly subscribe to um, uh, an email list and you know, obviously pay as a member if you wish to take care of those benefits. But there are rides all, almost organised in every night of the week. Um, so whether you want to ride in town or you actually want to go to Upton or Grafton or uh, a whole host of other areas, um, there's almost a, an organised ride uh, every night if that is of interest. Um, the one thing you'll notice that differentiates people who are looking to walk uh, on a path versus ride is uh, riders are generally looking for mileage, uh, looking for a variety of terrain. So everything from a double track in a wide, you know, paved path to, you know, very gnarly, rocky, steep, you know, sections of trail. Um, and so that's the thing that um, Hopkinton State Park and this land that uh, NEMBA owns. So this little land here is actually owned uh, by NEMBA and the rest of it is obviously public space. But um, the nice thing about these plots of land is they have a lot of variety. And that's what mountain bikers are really looking for, is variety. Um, and so you'll find there are wetlands, and in those wetlands a lot of scout projects have been conducted to build bridges to protect it and, and to provide access. And then you'll find that um, the trail maps are, are, are quite uh, well established, where they're actually graded from double track, which is the large dotted blue line. So that is effectively um, access for the fire trucks. And funnily enough, in the last uh, three or four years, there's been a fire bug in this area, lighting fires. And I've been riding after work one day, and there's fire trucks in the middle there, put the fire out, which is uh, very disappointing. Um, to then, obviously, various uh, levels of single track, which are the red dotted lines um, that are you know, narrow, obviously steep, rocky, depending on uh, the trail. And then actually here, if, you know, it's a bit of an eye chart, but there's a very tight network of trails where the club has actually built uh, what they call features. So sections of trail that actually have jumps uh, or certain types of challenges for mountain bikers. So, you know, at every level, whether you're one of my boys who are, you know, just beginning all the way to uh, quite advanced, this actually draws from the region uh, a quite a large amount of people visiting the area to, to ride mountain bikes. In fact, I know a couple of people from England uh, who have actually traveled to the US to specifically ride this piece of land. I couldn't, I couldn't guess it. Um, I think, you know, I, I tend to ride about 12 miles in a given, in a given day. So, but you could certainly ride a, a lot more than that. Now, do you know what's happened to the construction down there? And, um, uh, by the, the, the 
Uh, no, I've driven, driven past it. I don't know what's being put there. I assume a building of some sort. Uh, but there is an access point there that's now, I think, closed off because of that. Yeah. yeah. So I tend to find, uh, I actually enter via College Rock, uh, given that I live just off Ash Street. So I'll ride down and enter uh, via College Rock if I'm riding from my home. Otherwise, um, I have a lot of friends that meet me in town uh, who live in uh, the region, and they'll actually come to ride with me. And we tend to park at uh, Adam Street, which is sort of on the Holston side. Um, and that's quite accessible. Uh, otherwise, I have friends who actually ride uh, the Milford Trail around and they'll actually meet me um, you know, somewhere here where the Milford Trail actually intersects with, with the section of land. Um, but uh, trail maps published on site, so the Denver website actually for every uh, state park or uh, plot of land where there's trails, they actually have trail maps uh, published. Uh, so this is actually online uh, in a little bit more detail potentially. and. Um, the uh, ride schedules and all the information. And one thing that you know, I like about Nember, and the reason I mention it, is they hold uh, uh, training for people learning to ride. They hold training for people who want to learn how to maintain trails and actually do it properly to, you know, to standard. Um, they organize trail cleaning days. So right now, given the recent storms and the snow, they're actually out there clearing trees from a lot of these trails. Um, so every rider you'll notice uh, will actually be out there maybe with a handsaw in their, their pack. Um, so they keep the trails clean and uh, they do a number of um, charities for, for women and for children and whatnot. And they'll organise charities so children can actually get access to two wheels and a bike and actually get out and, uh, and get exercise and, and experience uh, you know, uh, fresh air and so forth. Um, but plenty of opportunities um, and as I said people tend to gravitate to those two sites given, uh, given the terrain and, and the variety. Any questions? Is anyone right in the room? Yeah, I, I don't know if there's a lot of accessibility to rentals. Um, so we were chatting earlier. So because of um, with Boy Scouts, we're actually taking in the Boy Scouts in May to uh, Highland Mountain Biking Park up in New Hampshire. And they have a really good program where for $100 you actually get a bike, you get some protective equipment, and you get a lesson to learn how to mountain bike and, and downhill. So there are options to rent bikes at some of the mountain biking parks. But in town, I'm not aware of, uh, you know, sort of formal bike rental. Um, Grace Cycles, which is in um, Milford, I believe. Holston. Holston, Grace is in here. Grace is in Holston, they're great. They, they organize rides as well. And then um, the Milford Bike Store does the same. They organise rides, um, and then obviously we have uh, Landry's in you know Westboro and, and other locations that do the same. Yeah. I, I also ride this trail, by the way. So when I want to get 20 miles under my belt, uh, I'll jump on uh, you know, 85, connect up to Milford, ride all the way around. And if I'm eager, I'll actually ride in the Framingham until the, the rail line actually starts. Yeah, it, it, it hits about somewhere here, and if I want, I'll actually backtrack or I'll ride through Ashland and get back to town on, on public roads. So I, I work from home. Uh, I can do that at 9 a.m. in the morning. I do it you know, 2 p.m. whenever I have time in the day. And you're commenting how frequently these trails are used, right? Any time of the day, I will see people on these trails riding, walking their dogs, walking their babies. A lot of, you know, a lot of mother groups, obviously. Um, you know, any time of the day. Uh, in, in almost any weather. I've ridden in the rain and I've seen people walking on these trails. So uh, certainly a big advocate, and I think they'd certainly get uh, their fair use. Okay. One more question. You said that's all uh, public conservation land. And on, on the Route 16 side, where you've got that big uh, rock quarry. Yep. I think, I mean, is that, I'm just curious, is they, I mean, are they just, I mean, that, that's all public land too. I mean, they, I don't think that's, e that's still in the area that's identified as being a... Yeah, I, I couldn't honestly answer the question. I, as I said, um, I know this land is owned by Denver. Um, everything else, I think, is you know, there's a private farm that has access to trails, and it, like in here, there's a horse farm, and there's trails that actually go through the farm, and they have signage to say, you know, you have access, but be respectful. Um, the quarry's up here, um, and that's actually eaten into a lot of the trails. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't tell you the status of the rest of the land. 
I may have misspoken. So we're getting to the end of our, uh, I think I have one more slide. There we go. Uh, orientation. Uh, this is the center trail, Hopkins and Lumber's at that end, the loop road's at this end, and this is the uh, cross country connector to get to the center trail that went in. Um, and doesn't show here because this was taken in the summer. This fall, we placed uh, a bench right here. And the bench is, uh, uh, Jeff Ferber was uh, the, the lead on this. Uh, Paul had, uh, Hopkins Area Land Trust had uh, an opportunity to use some of the granite that came out of the old Hughes uh, family dwelling. It was a granite that uh, uh, made their cellar and uh, some of the posts and beams in their cellar. Um, that's over on the Hughes property. Um, we got a grant, uh, dug them out of the forest, laid them out, uh, tried to match up what could be pretty quickly uh, benches and then had uh, a couple of local people that know how to do that uh, cart them over and we put five benches, Mavis? Mavis and I and Jeff worked on that. Uh, where uh, along center trail, along phase two of center trail and phase one of center trail using what we believe to be locally sourced granite or Milford sourced granite, um, uh, uh, rough hewn uh, in many cases, but we put some benches. We put the biggest one right here because we felt we wanted to have uh, a place for um, uh, viewers of cross-country meets to uh, go out and have a little cheering section and in that you never know when they're going to get there uh, after the start of a meet you need some place to sit down so uh, so we did that uh, I have a few announcements to make uh, but at first want to uh, thank Stuart and I want to thank Robert uh, at outstanding pre well and I want to thank Peter too but he's one of us Outstanding presentations by our guests. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's the kind of thing that we hope to do in advocating for trails. Uh, one, two, three uh, announcements. Um, in order, this Saturday, April 7th, 9 to 11 a.m. Uh, at the Hopkinton Historical Society, the Friends of Whitehall uh, are holding a special presentation on in uh, ceremonial stone landscaping by indigenous people that we find in the woods. Uh, Doug Harris, the Deputy Tribal Historic Preservation Officer of the Narragansett Indian uh, Tribe will be making the presentation. Um, uh, uh, photos, uh, maybe some mapping, uh, very interesting. Uh, 9 to 11 a.m. at the Historical Society put on by the Friends of Whitehall, a local conservation. The Hopkinton Historical Society uh, is on Hayden Road. Anybody have any idea what the address is? Um, uh, say again? Yeah, white building, little picket fence out there. It's got to be then in the 200s? No, in the Exactly. Um, uh, I've seen the flyer, and I've seen this, uh, the, the one photograph in the center of the flyer, and it's like, that's out in the woods, and it means something. Now, if I would come across it out in the woods, it would be like, wow, what is that about? Um, uh, uh, 
uh, Doug Harris uh, intends to tell us about that. So 9 to 11, that's this Saturday. Um, then the following Wednesday, so a week from tonight, uh, is our normal Trails Club meeting. Uh, our Trails Club meetings meet from 7 to promptly 8.30, and um, we meet across the street at the Masonic Lodge. Uh, anybody's welcome uh, to be a Trails Club member, you show up. Uh, you show up for one of our work sessions, you show up for one of our hikes, or you show up for a meeting. Uh, no dues, uh, no obligation. You can stop showing up anytime it gets boring. Uh, I showed up about four or four and a half years ago, and it, hadn't been, it hasn't gotten boring since then. Um, so uh, we encourage you to attend. Bring your ideas, your questions, uh, just come and listen. Uh, we uh, cover a wide variety of things that all somehow circle back to trails. And then Saturday the 14th, now speaking of volunteerism, Saturday the 14th, we are going to have a work day. It's, um, uh, it's uh, Center Trail Cleanup Day. Uh, we try to get that done before uh, the marathon. In this case, we're going to get it done about 48 hours before the marathon. It just, uh, it just so happened. Um, uh, we are going to meet at 9 a.m. Uh, at the parking lot on the loop road, so in the schools, on the loop road, the parking lot for fields 10 and 11. It's the nearest parking lot to uh, where the center trail intersects, where phase one of the center trail intersects with the loop road. We're gonna meet there. Um, we, have, uh, um, we have scouts from Troop 1, uh, thank you. We have scouts from Troop 1 that are going to uh, um, uh, be there to put in time. They have a, uh, a, a merit badge challenge. They need to get uh, seven hours apiece before they head out west to where they're going to get their last three on, uh, on one of their merit badges. Uh, the troop leaders uh, uh, came to us and said, can you find valuable work uh, for the troop? And we said, if you think helping us clean up Center Trail would be valuable work. We got all kinds of valuable work. So we're going to have uh, scouts there. We're going to have uh, uh, Trails Club members there. Uh, I'd say this: you want uh, you want to dress appropriately, bring gloves, um, and um, and bring any tools that you might have that will help us maintain. So uh, small hand saws, uh, loppers. Um, uh, rakes, especially leaf rakes, uh, we're going to make the two portions of the center trail look very presentable for Marathon Monday. It's a tremendous amount of use on Marathon Monday. Um, it's our spring cleanup. Um, you know, we'll be there three or four hours. We'll take uh, we'll take time from you in half hour increments. If you can come at nine and have to go someplace at nine thirty, we'll take it. Um, will work you like a dog in that half hour. But uh, uh, at any rate, uh, so that's, uh, that's Saturday the 14th. Peter. Just as an add-on to that, in case anyone was thinking there, you know, the center trail is only a half mile, there's not enough to do it well. The Wellesley Trail goes up that, but there's some pretty good trees down there, work to be done. And as you see, the cross-country course goes up that, As Robert covered in his, uh, in his talk, uh, um, uh, especially the part that is a rail bed, uh, there are uh, 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 ditches along both sides, drainage ditches along both sides. They tend to fill up um, in, the, uh, in the winter. They tend to fill up with uh, things that are washed in there uh, and then that they prevent the flow. So we're going to be doing a fair amount of uh, uh, moving things around and dragging things out of there because uh, the, the key to any of this is you keep 
the water off of our trail uh, and keep it where we want it in the ditch and we'll be so much better. Um, as you can imagine with uh, the winter that we had with the heavy snows and the high winds, <coughs> there's a fair amount of, uh, uh, of just debris, uh, sticks and branches and what have you down. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, it's only a half mile, but uh, it's a half mile of uh, 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 times uh, 12 feet wide. Um, there's a fair amount of ground to cover but we'll uh, make it look presentable. It's a great way to be outside. I looked at the weather forecast, uh, you know, out 10 days, it looks like it's getting better. Uh, that's, um, you know, if we get lucky. Oh, we're gonna do this rain or shine, okay? Uh, we probably won't do as much if it's raining real hard. Anything else? Terrific. Uh, now, we've got a number of displays set out at the tables. We invite, we have refreshments in the back. We invite you to come up. We'll man some of the tables. Some of us that know what, uh, uh, what the maps on the tables are about, um, uh, we can uh, help you find places to explore. Thank you all. Okay.